Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program today. My name is Michelle Massey. I am the Director of Public Programs at the Museum of Russian Art. It's our pleasure to have you here virtually. Um, I'm sitting in the gallery right now, actually, and uh, I want you to know that the museum is open for viewing. Uh, so you can come uh, if you're local and visit Marlena's uh, exhibition. That's not, this is the new exhibition, uh, our main exhibition. Uh, you'll be seeing more of Marlena's exhibition obviously today. So the museum is open for viewing, but you know, the wonderful thing about virtual programming is that we can reach all of you who um, are staying safely at home or maybe aren't local or from uh, all over the country and all over the world. So it's a, it's a great thing that we can connect with you this way as well. We have other virtual programs that are listed on our website. Uh, if you go to timora.org, I will be posting that uh, link and, and other links for your information today. We have quite a, um, a listing of virtual tours uh, and other events. And then uh, on that note, we are, uh, we've opened three exhibitions this month at the museum and we are going to be doing a virtual grand opening on March 2nd, which is next Tuesday. So today we are going to be in conversation with artist Marlena Miles and our curator at here at the Museum of Russian Art, Masha Zavialova. You will be able to ask questions anytime during the program by using your chat function and we will probably answer some of them along the way uh, and we'll certainly get to them at the end of the program. Uh, we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes for question and answers, and we are slated to go until 1215 Central today. Uh, we will also be recording this session and we'll be posting it in a number of places and I'll be sending an email with that information. So you're welcome to view this later and send it on to friends and family if you'd like. We really appreciate the support. And with that, I wanna let you know a little bit more about uh, the support that we've received here at the museum and with Marlena's exhibition. So here, it's wonderful. Uh, the Museum of Russian Art in partnership with Marlena Miles is a fiscal year 2020 recipient of a cultural community partnership grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board thanks to a legislative appropriation by the Minnesota State Legislature and a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. A really important thing to mention because uh, these wonderful projects and exhibitions are, are supported um, and uh, that, that's what makes these things happen. So with that, I think it's time to get our program started. And first of all, I'm going to introduce you to our chief curator. Uh, she has uh, created over 50 exhibitions at the Museum of Russian Art. She's an award-winning translator and writer for our art catalogs. Uh, she is very beloved and I'm happy to introduce her to you now. Please welcome Dr. Masha Zavialova. Uh, greetings everyone. It's my pleasure today to introduce our new exhibition that's been uh, around for a few weeks and the artist behind the art and the, I, uh, the story, uh, Marlena Miles. Marlena Miles is a native artist. Uh, she, is, uh, she lives in St. Paul. Uh, she is fairly active in public media. And if you go to uh, her website, which is very easy to find, you just uh, enter Marlena Miles and you can see her name uh, in one of the little windows on the screen. You can find uh, some more uh, samples, examples of your work and uh, links to your public appearances. And with that, I would like to welcome Marlena Miles to our virtual uh, museum. And my first question to her will be, of course, to tell us a little bit more about yourself, Marlena. And uh, here she is. Hello, everybody. Um, I guess I'm Marlena Miles. I'm a Dakota artist. I live here in St. Paul, Minnesota. A lot of my work is created digitally. I'm a self-taught artist. I've been working with computers since I was like 13 years old. So it's really natural for me to, you know, follow tutorials online and really grow as technology grows. I think a lot of digital artists are like this um, with our methods. 
compared to maybe more traditional ways of creating art. Um, the kind of art that I create, um, it's created in Adobe Illustrator, but I've also done animations and also I'm working towards creating augmented reality with these kind of art forms to bring like my art into a more interactive format. Um, I've also done fabric designs and children's books besides um, the illustrations that I create. And with this, and with this um, exhibition, I was really excited when the director emailed me about asking if I wanted to participate because I grew up in a small town, in Rapid City, South Dakota for middle school and high school. And after school, I'd actually go to the library where they had air conditioning and um, I would read about Russian history. You know, and my favorite literature was Russian literature and my favorite music is classical music from Russia. So I had a lot of interest growing up in my teenage years about Russian history. So to me, I think it's like amazing coincidence that somehow I have a solo show at the Museum of Russian Art as a Native American, like I never thought something like that could be possible. So I'm just really happy to be able to, you know, tell this story the best I can. And so I welcome you all to it. Yeah, uh, Marlena, I also, it's a coincidence for not just for you and for me, for all of us that the Museum of Russian Art mm -hmm. happens to be in Minnesota. It could be in any state. It's just our founder lives in Minnesota, and that's why he set up this unique museum here. Uh, uh, only one for thousands of miles around at the collecting Museum of Russian Art. And um, so we have a fairly uh, medium sized Russian community here. It's not large. And I'm quite excited to have this exhibition on Russian colonialism in Alaska in our museum, because actually I'm sure that few Russians know this part of history. Um, I remember I watched a film a while ago, uh, it was a period movie and someone called Alaska Russian America. So that's the name before Alaska was Alaska, it was Russian America for a short while. So uh, it's, uh, I'm actually quite excited to have the show here for the benefit of my countrymen, uh, uh, Russian Minnesotans, but also I hope that some, uh, because uh, this presentation will be online, that uh, Russians from Russia will also learn a little bit more from the perspective of the local people, or I mean, local means the North American continent people, local compared to Russia. So how did uh, this theme came about. What's your interest in the, in the theme of uh, Russian America? Well, a lot of work that I do outside of this ex exhibition is telling my people's story. Because also growing up in school, um, I don't think many people in Minnesota learned about Dakota history. They didn't learn about Abraham Lincoln having the largest you know, mass execution here in Mankato, Minnesota. And um, people, you know, they say I live in Minnesota and they don't even know what that word means. They speak Dakota every day and they don't know, um, you know, they don't recognize that this is indigenous homelands. It has an ancient history that we're still here today. So um, when I had the opportunity to work on this, I, you know, I wanted to really try to see both sides or all the different sides, I guess, that um, occurred in Russian Alaska, because there are different viewpoints from both the Russians and the Alaskan natives. Um, people had different political ambitions, people had different economic reasons for the things that they did. And I just, as a Dakota person, you know, I could relate about how knowing my own people's history, how they've changed throughout the years, um, adapting in new um, European technologies and how that's changed things. And then also the struggle we have to keep our traditions alive. I think both Russians and Alaskan natives, they both, you know, they go through that same struggle today and remembering their traditions of the past. 
So that's how I came to the show with sort of how I work normally and then trying to look at how the Russians and Alaskan natives, how they might be able to, how they actually um, do the same methods in their cultures. Yeah, you know, that's very true. Uh, I'm a first generation immigrant and I'm part of a Russian folk performance group where we try to keep these traditions uh, going of actually Russian peasant women folk art, folk culture. There are just four of us at this point and uh, it's a very small group but it's been a fascinating journey. And for me, uh, you know, when I came here, being raised in the Soviet times, I learned about American history from a different perspective, from the Soviet perspective, and from the perspective of a child who used to read a lot. And uh, when I came here and I was, you know, sitting by the lake, like Lake Calhoun, what I felt was the native presence because I grew up reading books like uh, Fenimore Cooper and mine read, well, Fenimore Cooper and one of his books, I think it's his, The Last of the Mohicans. Even the title struck me so sad as a child. What does it mean, The Last of the Mohicans? So I hope that uh, there are Mohicans around. Are you part Mohican? Yeah, my dad's from that tribe actually, so. <laughs> I'm so great, so glad that this novel is not, the title is not true. Could you show us some of your art? Yeah, I can start my presentation that shares it with the people who come to the show today. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, that's the title. Then this was the sketch for the piece that I wanted to start out the show with. Um, it's called The Mystery of Chirikov's Lost Men. Sorry if I pronounced the Russian names, not no, Russian-like. You know. It's absolutely correct. Yeah, so, um, you know, the Tsar sent, we all know the Bering Strait, and he gets the credit for this quote-unquote, you know, discovering Alaska, but there's actually two ships, and Alexei Chirikov was the first one to actually reach land and he actually interacted with the Klingit people. And so there's um, two different sides to this story. The Russians, you know, they wanted, they needed to collect resources. It's a long journey. Um, they needed fresh water. They're looking for supplies to bring back to the ship. So he sent some men to shore and he gave them like a cannon to shoot off once they reached the shore to let them know that they arrived safely to that shore. And the cannon never went off. And so they waited as, as long as they could to like try to see what would happen. And at night, you know, they saw a fire on the shore. So they thought perhaps the men you know, actually did reach it, but then actually used the cannons like they had wanted. But the weather had been so bad that it took them five days to be able to get close enough to shore again to send another group of men. And when those men, the same thing happened. They never shot off the cannons to let them know that they had reached the shore. So when they saw the fires again, they thought, well, they must have been captured or harmed by like the Alaskan natives, the Klingit people. And that morning, the Klingits, they came out to the ship with canoes and they were, they, they thought they were being hostile. The Russians thought that because they wouldn't board, they're waving white flags, trying to welcome them aboard their boat, but they wouldn't come any closer. And then the Klingit people, they were telling the Russians to come to shore actually, like you're safe to board here, but neither one could understand each other. And so Alexei Chirikov, Captain Chirikov, he, in his journal, he wrote down that the men, you know, they die at the hands of the hostile natives, but the Klingit people, they actually have oral traditions that say those Russian men, you know, they said they were 
treated poorly aboard that ship and they had run away to join their people. And then there's families that descended from this, these first Russians, you know, that still today that they tie their ancestries to these people. And so um, that's what I wanted to start out the exhibition with was sort of, you know, these different people trying to come together to understand each other, not quite doing it, but, you know, I think it's, something that even today, you know, we all have different backgrounds and I think something we can learn from each other is experience each other's cultures in a good positive way. Um, and then this was the actual concept, how I came up with it. I was reading this book called Russians and Klingon America. It's a really great book. I highly recommend it if you want to learn more about this. They have Russians and natives and they share from both sides oral traditions you know um, a lot of times native oral traditions are not considered fact-based or they don't consider it scientific so um, the western people studying our cultures they disregard it as just myths or legends or something when it's actually our way of telling our history so this book they do a really great job of including those those stories those songs um, from the Alaskan Native side, so that's why I highly recommend this book. But one of the Western anthropologists, Alan Ingstrom, he was visiting Alaska in 2006, and one of the researchers there, Chris Howard, he told him about these petroglyphs he found at Surge Bay. That's where this meeting happened, and that's where um, Ingstrom had wanted to go to visit. It's really isolated. It's hard to reach even to this day, but um, the, the guy who knew about the petroglyphs, he, the Ingstrom, he asked him, he's like, is it at these coordinates? Because he had been doing a lot of research trying to figure out where this had happened. And it was exactly where he thought it would be. And so um, he did a tracing of the actual boat that the Alaskan Native people they had seen, and it must have been such a remarkable event that they wanted to record it down as sort of a rock carving, and that's what he's tracing right there, and that to me made me want to, that's why I figured, that's why I want to start with that, you know, because I was thinking about how do I start this show, what do I want to start with, and when I saw that, you know, it really struck me, because here in Minnesota, we have a lot of these ancient petroglyphs that go back 10,000 years that talk about you know, what religions or what was important to our people. So to know that the Alaskan natives, they recorded this event, I knew it was important to them. And so that's what made me want to start here. And then I was also researching, you know, like what's their belief system about like their natural surrounding because that's, you know, part of their culture and the Northern Lights to like my people, we believe it's like, um, you know, it's spirits, it's something that you don't really want to like whistle at or sing at or anything to disturb them because it could be scary. And so I wanted to look at what they believe. And they believe that it's spirits of warriors who died during warfare. And if it's a really strong or remarkable um, aurora, that it could be an omen of impending war and bloodshed. And so I thought, that would be a good way to tie, you know, the history that they would have with the Russians because the, some Alaskan natives, Alaskan tribes, they would um, be more welcoming to, I don't wanna say assimilation, but be more accepting of the Russians. Whereas like the Klingit people, they were not accepting of the Russian people for the most part, um, they, are very proud of their history, um, very proud of owning their land. There's always this saying out there that natives don't understand land ownership, but that's not at all true. They would create those totem poles to tell the history of their inheritance, of both their spirituality, of both their ancestors, um, and both including the land that they lived on. And so these sort of totems represent to each other you know, who lives here and who has the right to live here. And so this Northern Lights sort of ties into another piece, a couple of pieces that I have about like the battle at Sitka. Um, 
that first wash that first meeting happened in about 1741 and by 1804 um, they would have the Russians and the Klingit people would have basically one big final battle over a small piece of land at Sitka which would eventually become where the Russian fur traders would set up their capital at Sitka and so the other piece starts out in the day in the nighttime and this piece is supposed to be more towards becoming daytime like they kind of balance each other because like when I think of Alaska I know part of it's in the arctic circle half is day and half is night throughout the year so I kind of like that idea um so Stunuk's vision he he knew that the Russians in them would have a final battle or some sort of big battle. And so they actually created a fort at Sitka to prepare to could withstand Russian cannon fire. And this battle went on for four days before the Alaskan natives planned a retreat. And they call that the Kiksadi survival march because they had their women and children at that fort with them and like the third night they had the women and the elders and the children they did a back trail out of there sort of while the warriors kept fighting and so the russians they really thought that everybody was still there and by the fourth night the warriors finally evacuated the fort and when the russians showed up there was nobody there like they finally went to shore, went into the fort, and there was nobody there. And they were very surprised at how could they have vanished. And so this survival march, they went back to a former village site they had that was on the other side of the island. And they actually set up a barricade that kept the other inland tribes from trading with the Russians and sort of cut them off from that. And this, the Russians, you know, they were struggling. They needed the the Alaskan natives to trade with them so they could acquire the furs to sell. And so they eventually made peace with the Klingit people the best they could by giving them gifts and inviting them back into that um, fort that they lost, supposedly. But it's an interesting um, level of respect that they had for each other as warriors, as even if they fought afterwards, you know, they made peace with each other and they sort of respected each other's might. And so that's how I tied these three pieces together. Um, and this is, I've done like an illustrated, I've illustrated a book called Thank You Poems of Gratitude. And so I did this, this style was what I wanted to do when it came to these versus this style that was very smooth um, very vector light, very digital like. When I wanted to create these pieces, I wanted to be like a story, like this style. So that's what came up. That's what inspired the artistic styling of those two pieces. And then I also created because, like I said, the Russians were relying on the Alaskan natives to provide for them because they had the understanding, the knowledge of hunting that the last the Russians. You know, they don't have that knowledge and it was very too hard for them to do. And there was never enough Russians actually living in Alaska to be able to hunt as many furs that they had um, in the millions. And these two, the sea otter spirit and the northern versatile spirit, they represent, you know, the animals that were caught up in between these groups of people. I know a lot of the history is always talked about from a human perspective, but I wanted to include, you know, the animal's perspective because both of these, they were, you know, they existed in the millions before the Russians came with their fur trade ambition for the Americans or the French or the British. And by the end of it, you know, there's only 2000, I think, sea otters. And then the seals, you know, they were down to maybe 50 to 100,000, even, and then today they're still very, you know, endangered species. And so we're working hard to sort of bring them back from the verge of extinction. So I wanted to also include them as part of this story. And they were inspired by other animal spirits that I've created in the past. Um, I call them Nagi, which is in Dakota. It means like you're 
your spirit and they represent, you know, the pieces, the geometric shape represents the pieces of the universe that came together to create life on this planet. And so that's why they're not totally realistic. They're kind of abstract. And that little star shape on their forehead, that's the morning star in Dakota. It means like wisdom and knowledge and um, the light and the darkness. So it also, I wanted to have humans think about, you know, animals and the things we can learn from the things, you know, learn from animals and how we can become better um, relatives to nature. So that was why I created those pieces the way I did. And this was called the Massacre at Refuge Rock. You can see the sketch, which I created in Procreate on my iPad and then in Illustrator. I've done the vectorization of it. Um, the Massacre at Refuge Rock. That is not the Klingit people, that is the Aleutic people or the Aleut, depending on how you want to say it. Um, and traditionally, they lived on these smaller islands and whenever there was their men were at war, the women, they would take refuge on these certain rocks that at low tide are like impossible to get onto it because the cliffs are so high once the tide went down. And so that they had a few of these rocks that they would take refuge on during times of war. And this massacre, they kind of call it their version of like the Wounded Knee Massacre you might hear about in South Dakota because it was very one-sided. The mid 1700s, the Russian fur traders, the Kodiak Islands, they wanted control of it. And the Alutic people, they were really resistant against it. They were fighting for their own rights to their own lands. And one day the, um, Shilikov, I think his name is, he staged an attack on them and uh, thousands, uh, almost, they say as many as 3,000 men, women, and children were killed and not one single Russian person died during this entire battle. And the women, they were, they didn't want to be captured or anything. So there's stories too of women jumping off these cliffs to avoid being captured by the Russian men um, because they were fearful of what would happen to them. And today they're still uncovering at this rock, they're still uncovering, you know, the, the signs of the massacre that happened there. Because I guess after this happened, you know, a lot of people didn't talk about this part of history there in Alaska and they don't have any sort of memorial to these people there. And so that's sort of today how they're acknowledging the past is, you know, actually looking at what happened. So, and then after this, the surviving men, they were forced into slavery for the Russian fur traders because once again, I said like the Russians, they didn't have the skills to um, obtain their furs. And so the men, they were, we were forced into slavery and they would also be forced to fight the Klingit people, a different tribe. They were not like relatives or anything. They were actually sort of warring tribes for this before the Russians showed up. So the Russians would actually use them to fight against other natives as well as part of it. Um, and as a result of the massacre, you know, the people in this Kodiak Islands, they lost all like sovereignty, the rights to govern themselves. Um, the women, they were forced to live in the Russian villages. Um, the kids were forced to go to Russian schools. And that brings me to, I can show you the process video of it. I mean, so you can understand how it works. I can speed it up a little bit. But when I create an illustrator, you know, I usually use a lot of layers, but I wanted to try something a little bit different. So I was using, using the gradient map. Um, that they have an illustrator to create sort of the curves of the person's face, the woman's face. I was using strange colors on purpose because I wanted to reflect on how maybe the Russians looked at 
the women of this tribe because they had base tattoos and these tattoos, you know, they showed the accomplishments of the ancestors, they represented your social standing, um, any sort of spiritual power you may have, and also represented beauty. And to Russian people, the Russian fur traders, they thought these were hideous, deplorable, and they thought it made you a savage. Um, they wrote, they called the women, like the ugliest women on earth, like they're very rude in their um, journals, I guess, so. That's why I want to create her strange looking so that maybe you see it from the Russian point of view, you might think, you know, this looks like an alien or something. But to me, I thought it was beautiful. So that's why I sort of want to balance those um, different ways of viewing each other in this piece as well. But like I was saying with the how they were forced basically to become assimilated by the Russian fur traders. Um, those Russian fur traders, they actually brought in them, they wanted, they requested monks to come to Alaska to um, further assimilate the, the Alaskan native people, but the monks, they actually, you know, they fought against the fur traders abuse against the women, against the children, they actually, um, they believe that, you know, you can believe in God without needing to forget about your language, forget about your own culture. Like, that's not something you need to erase to become, you know, part of the Russian Orthodox Church. And so St. Herman of Alaska, he was one of the monks that, you know, he was actually abused by the Russian fur traders for standing up for Alaskan natives, the Lutic people on that island. Um, he set up orphanages when there were, when the Alaskan natives were dying from European diseases and pandemics. You know, he was out there doing his best to um, care for them and heal them. And there was also, you know, conflicts too with like some Alaskan natives. They still didn't want them there and a few monks are actually killed by them but for the most part like saint herman he was he's considered like the the saint of north america i guess he was very kind and he earned a respect of both the russian fur traders and alaskan natives and so that's why i wanted to illustrate his role and then there's saint peter the Aleut, they call him they say he's the first Russian, I mean, the first native to become a saint. And the Alaskan fur trade, the Russian fur trade, it extended all the way down to California. That's something we might not know too much about. And he, they say he was part of the enslaved Aleutic people who were forced to be the hunters for the Russians. And when they went to California, the Spanish people there, they didn't want the Russians encroaching on their own fur trade. And so he became a martyr um, when they were captured by the, they say the Jesuits or the Catholics there. Um, but also people have done research and they think his whole story might just have been fictional to um, impress the Alaskan natives to be joining their religion. Like it might've been based off real events and they sort of embellished it, but I can't say which is it, which was what, but I felt like he was just, just to share the story of how the fur traders, how far they went to California and the, how the men were enslaved. I felt like that was important to the exhibition. So I also want to include it because, you know, the monks, they were doing their best to help the Alaskan natives in a way that, you know, their God taught them. And I felt like they were honest about it. Unlike um, maybe here in Minnesota, the missionaries were a lot different. Or they, some were helpful, but they also had a different kind of goal, I think, in towards um, getting you to speak English versus speak your own native language. So I also found that, um, pretty impressive by the Russian Orthodox monks. And this was inspired by the hunting gear of the Lutic people. If you look, you can see the, the lines and 
I found that really beautiful. So I kind of incorporated that. And then the icons of the Russian Orthodox Church, I find those, I love the decorations and the borders and really just like the power you can see in the, in the figures. Like even if you're not part of this religion, I think you can kind of, you can get that feeling from the artwork. And then I like to work at different eras of um, design. And I, for some reason, I was into the 80s when I was working on this piece. So I threw in the 80s vaporwave design. And that's how I sort of came up with this neon looking icon that has the lines of elitic people. And I wanted like the, the cross that's behind them. I wanted it to line up sort of to represent you know, how we're all connected as, even if we're different types of people, like there's, as human beings, we're connected and, you know, that compassion and love, I guess, that, you know, we can overcome a lot of differences through that. And then, like I was talking about how the Russian monks, how they incorporated, you know, Alaskan native languages into their teachings, into teaching them their, their religion. I created this indigenous education in Russia, Russian one, two, three, four, there's four pieces. There are paper cutouts. The background has the primers and the lutic, and then they translated sort of, they translated their Bible into a lutic, and then they wrote it out in old Cyrillic, I guess. And, but it's, it's a Russian person who is reading this, they would be reading it as, the Lutic language, basically. So they basically translated that native language into Cyrillic. And if you're to read it, you're basically reading the native language. And over the words is different um, paper cutouts that represent indigenous knowledge that the Russians considered primitive, but they actually, they needed it in order to accomplish their goals of the fur trade. So they might look at native people as savages or uneducated, but they needed our ability to hunt. They needed, you know, understanding of the plants. They needed our understanding of the stars, you know, to accomplish their goals. So it's interesting to me that they called us uneducated when they needed our indigenous knowledge base. And how I made these paper cutouts, I have a little stencil cutting machine. I made two different layers. The yellow layer represents like the top layer you see there. And then where the blue was, that's the second sheet of paper. And that's what was actually cut out, leaving the white part. And so then I just sort of put little 3D blocks between the layers to sort of give it a depth, a depth to it. Um, in Illustrator, I work a lot in layers. And I felt like this is a way to make like a physical format that looks like how I work in layers in Illustrator. And here's some of the concept I was talking about. Um, you can see the missionary primer in the Lutic, and then there's also the Dakota one that we have that they were, you know, teaching the Dakota people to have an alphabet because they didn't have one. Here in Minnesota, Abaday Makaska, or known as Lake Calhoun, that was actually the first time Dakota was ever written down by. Um, the missionaries that met the cloud man that lived there. So I think it's interesting that, you know, here in the Twin Cities, we live on Dakota homelands and we have like that sort of remarkable history at that lake that people just go there to have fun all the time, I guess, but they don't understand like the, um, I guess the drastic change that happened to Dakota people at that site. And so, when I look at like the Alutic, the missionary primer, you know, I feel like, you know, this was a big turning point in their own culture to be able to write down their own stories um, and sort of keep track of their own history. Because like I said, the Russian monks, they weren't telling them they had to erase who they were to join the church. And it wasn't until the Russians left Alaska and sold it to America that the Americans forced them to stop speaking Russian and the Alaskan natives. So they kind of lost, you know, that strength, I guess, something to pass down 
to their ancestors when the Americans were forcing them to assimilate the way Dakota people or native people and this part of the continent were forced to assimilate. And this brings me to like the language revitalization because here in the Twin Cities, I've made like a Dakota land map, you know, that talks about historical places, but also fits the modern places into Dakota and, you know, the modern things we see. Because I also want to open people's eyes to the fact that history didn't just stop then, that it's still going in the future. Because when I look at what both Russian descendants and Alaska natives, what they're doing currently in Alaska, you know, they're still revitalizing their own languages. And, and that's sort of what inspired this piece was, have you ever thought of becoming a new and better person? Because I think a lot of immigrants, they come to America hoping for an American dream. They want to improve their lives. They want to, you know, find that opportunity for themselves. But you lose a lot. You lose, you could see how there's a mixture of Alaskan natives, there's a mixture of Russia. And, you know, it's very strong, very pronounced, but throughout the generations, you know, there's people here who say, you know, they're German or Scandinavian, but they don't speak their ancestors' language. They've never been back to their own homelands. And so you come to America for opportunity to become a better person, but you lose a lot of who you were to do that. So that's sort of um, why I created this piece was to show over time the bonding of like the Russians and Alaska natives, sort of what they lost and what they gained through that. And then also when it was sold to America, what further was lost, you know, in order to become part of the land of opportunity, as they call it. And that brings me to visiting the Nilchik, Alaska, which is an animation I created. I worked with um, Wayne Lemon. He was, he's descended from the people at the Nilchik, which was started from Alaskan women, Alaskan native women married to Russian men. A few families gathered together and they started this village. And it's so isolated that the Russian they speak there is still, it's very old fashioned compared to the Russian that, you know, Masha might speak and what people in Moscow might speak. So he's been working with a few linguists to record as much of that um, Russian that they can because it's mostly spoken by Russian elders because I, I think in the 60s, you know, the, the Cold War happened with Russia and they were sort of really embarrassed to be Russians because they didn't want to be called traitors or they didn't want to be called a communist or, you know, the things that they do to put down Russia in America, you know, the propaganda, I guess. And so they were ashamed to like teach this Russian to their kids. And so people like Wayne, he can't speak too well this Russian, but his you know, his parents and his older relatives, they can. And so he is working to record as much of it as possible, you know, to document that maybe revitalize it if that's possible. And so I use some of his recordings to animate this piece that shows the language. Sharing could cause you. What got sharing could cause you? Прогуляться. Вот как, вот как вместо прогуляться. Напали на бабушку серые волки. Вот как, вот как серые волки. Оставили бабушки ножки дорожки. Вот как, вот как ножки дорожки. Монах, я знаю, что Бориса создал, что наши воеваты. А чиновник стал с бумагами рыться, а мужик стал ваше работать. And those are two like traditional Russian poems that people in Russia may know. Um, but you know, I was reading comments on those original audios that he put on there. You know, and there's Russians who couldn't understand what they're saying, like they said. You know, it sounds like he's speaking with a bunch of rocks in his mouth, or he sounds very angry. 
Um, and some people too is saying the poem that she recited, you know, she missed some words or she forgot. Certain parts of it in street or she said it in how the Russian language. But and so that's sort of how you know, when it comes to the show, how I wanted to present it was from the past, you know, the traditions, the things that happened in history and sort of what that, how that's still affecting people today in Alaska. Um, because here in Minnesota, you know, my people are so affected by things in the past. And, you know, I want people to become aware of that history so that we can create like a better future and embrace that path in Alaska. Um, they're still working on that. Um, they're, they found, you know, that site of the massacre. They're doing more research to uncover what happened there. They found a fort where they had that battle of Sitka. You know, they found an actual fort remnants and, you know, they're working to highlight that part of their history. They are returning artifacts and historical pieces back to the Alaskan Native that they have in their museum collections because it's cultural property that those people own. And so it's important to their own traditions for them to have it. And so that's, you know, I feel like here in Minnesota, that's something we can relate to is embracing the history of Minnesota in order to build like a better future that, you know, we actually listen to the past. So thank you, that's, I guess we can open it up to questions or anything like that. My goodness, thank you so much, Marlena. We have had a lot of conversation going on in the chat box, which is so great. And mostly, I think, um, a lot of gratitude for you sharing your work uh, and sharing all of your research um, with the rest of us. I know there are, there are a couple of directions we could go here. A lot of folks are wanting to know um, more about your process. And you did show us some of the vector work. Um, I, I've had a number of questions about your sketch uh, process using an iPad. I don't know that maybe many of us have seen that. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, I bought that iPad recently. I had a smaller tablet I sketched on. Um, I felt like Procreate was faster to sketch. And normally I don't even create sketches because an illustrator you can move your layers around and you can make so many adjustments that you don't really need to make a sketch the same way you do if you're painting. But for these pieces, I felt like it would help me save time if I actually worked out my sketch before spending a lot of time making those adjustments. But it's basically it's just drawing. You create like a background layer, and you can make a new layer, you can make like the middle ground, a new layer, you can make the foreground. So unlike a painting that's all in one layer, digital art you're allowed to create multiple layers and that way you can still move things around and then when I animate those layers you know I'm, I'm able to separate the pieces apart and that helps me when it comes to either animating it or moving it to augmented reality so I like the flexibility of digital art and layers. It's fascinating and honestly the, her work is as stunning in person as it is uh on this presentation as well, you should know that. Uh, I wanna mention that this exhibition has been extended through March 14th. It's been very, very popular. Um, and if you're able to come, know that the museum does uh, control capacity and whatnot. So it's a very safe place to be, but we wanna make sure if you're able to come that you can, but this is going to be a great resource. Um, notably, I think for native communities, uh, whether you, know, you and I are both from South Dakota, um, for sharing with native communities all over this about this history. And I had a question come up um, that I think is really interesting. Um, have you considered or are you currently offering workshops or any of this kind of discussion to some of the native communities or reservation communities? Have you thought about doing that? Yeah, I have a few ideas actually written down of how, you know, I can show them technology that would let them you know, bring to life the stories that are on their lands or 
even to create their own sort of land maps that have a history, but also modern things that the people there know and, you know, create a living history through a map and like also create it through augmented reality because I feel like you know, that lets people walk through the art, you know, and see it in a three-dimensional format. So I think in the upcoming years, I will be trying to um, make this accessible as something on the reservation and mm -hmm. make workshops there. I think that would be great. Uh, I have a question here. It kind of goes back to the, um, the origin story of this <laughs> exhibition. Um, and how, you know, as the Alaskan Native community is not directly, you know, your community and you went into the research and the journey through this was, I would like to know maybe what was most surprising to you about this history? Was there something that um, you, you weren't expecting that you learned through your research? Yeah, I mean, I was really surprised by the role of the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, like, it's unfortunate that you know, people were enslaved and people, you know, they lost their culture, but it's also interesting to know that there's people there, like the Russian monks who weren't there for, you know, a economic reason. They weren't there to profit off the native people and they're actually there to try to do the best they can to help them. And, you know, they believe in their own religions and Alaskan natives, you know, some of them too, when these bad things happened to them, they lost faith in their own religion. And so, they, they were more willing to embrace the Russian Orthodox Church. And to, to, to this day, they still give sermons and stuff in their own Alaskan tongues. So, I mean, they, the Russian church, you know, allowed them to become the priests, allowed them to become the leaders of that church in their own villages. So to, to this day, it's sort of like a, a bonding for the community at these churches that they, you know, they teach this religion in their own languages, which I found was pretty fascinating compared mm -hmm. to what happened with my people. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a lot different. Uh, I have a question that went back to the, the Tlingit uh, culture. So the question reads, do you know of other native or indigenous tribes that also marked their land or territory? If it's not completely true, says the questioner, that natives, indigenous people didn't own land, then why is that the predominant narrative? It's the predominant narrative to make you feel better about mm -hmm. taking this land, just to be straightforward. Um, yeah. Even Dakota people, we had um, sort of land ownerships in the wintertime. The villages would break down in the smaller villages so that people had better accesses to resources during the winter times. And they were marked by, you know, certain territories. You can hunt over into your neighboring village's land because, you know, you're taking more than what was allotted to you. Um, but the tribes on the coast of the Northwest up to Alaska, down to like Seattle, the totems that you see, those are marking the cultural property of those people. And it's not just land because we don't separate land from, you know, our ancestors or upper spirituality is all connected. So that totem, it's telling, you know, their cultural property and that includes, you know, everything about them. And so um, I think Western society, you get a piece of paper that tells you you own some land and mm -hmm. you put a fence around it. Um, but Native people, you know, we have a different respect for land. And I think, like, you, like I said, um, people say that Native people didn't understand owning land. It's because like, like Western people, they sell land, they sell that piece of paper. But for us, it's like, do you sell your grandmother? Like, right. that's, you know. Absolutely. I want to bring Masha into this conversation too. Masha, are you there with us? I want to know, um, bring the sort of conversation between, you know, the curator of, you know, the Museum of Russian Art and with Marlena, with two, um, you know, you, you guys got to know each other through this exhibition. And Masha, I want to know, first of all, I mean, do you have any questions as this presentation has come up? But also maybe you can mention um, if there were things that surprised you or that you learned through this process? Uh, well, yeah, I learned a lot actually because I didn't know that part of Russian history in that detail. But also, uh, you know, I'm Russian, so I was born in Russia. 
and the exhibition is called Russian colonialism in Alaska. Of course, you are as being part, there is this word Russian in the title. I, I was thinking back uh, into about Russian history. And uh, I know it from my, from my family history that you always have to also separate governments from the people because you know, mid 19th century, uh, Russia still had served them. So part of the uh, population that had power, a very small percentage owned or could actually sell and use the labor of the majority of the population that were Russian peasants. So the Russian governments, you know, historically were violent to uh, people outside and inside the country, like many governments are. I don't know, it's something in the nature of power. So that was the fascinating part uh, of, of this exhibition to me, you know, to look back into my own family history, back, think back about Russian imperialism before the revolution, during the Soviet times and in contemporary mm -hmm. Russia. Uh, also, I was um, uh, very uh, happy that this exhibition is so focusing on details, you know, on individual stories. And that's really, Marlena, I find it, uh, it's, a, it's a great approach to a show. So not generalizing, but like mm -hmm. focusing on uh, individual stories. And probably that's what artists do. And I was very fascinated by the, uh, I, I love symbols, cultural symbols and codes. So I was fascinated with the uh, various uh, symbols and codes that Marlena uses in her art. So my question uh, to Marlena, I know that some of them are traditional. So how, what's your use of symbology? What's your approach to it? How do you, how do you unearth those symbols? Do you imagine some of them yourself or add to uh, the language of symbols that you use? Um, well, like some of the symbols that I use, I think you could say their cultural property, their own by the whole tribe uses like the morning star symbol um, certain geometric shapes, the certain materials we use, like I can't copyright the morning star symbol and say it's mine, you know, because I think all Dakota people have rights to it. Um, I think it's the same way if you look at like the, the church symbol, like the cross, um, one church can't copyright that symbol and say it, it belongs to them because it's sort of like a property of anybody who believes in that church. Um, so I think it's sort of the, the symbology is like I want to teach about what things mean to me and then my people and then find connections to other um, people around the world because like I was showing my work to my friend who lives in Latvia and they have a lot of quote unquote pagan symbols as well and one of their symbols is the morning star and you know our people we've never met each other um, we're so far apart but you know, I think our people looking up at the stars, they saw that as a source of wisdom and that became like inspiration to them. And that symbol means, you know, sort of like wisdom and stuff to them as well as it means to my people. So I think it's interesting to, to study these ancient symbols and humanity and around the world, how we evolved to relate to those symbols. So that's why I like to incorporate them into my work as sort of like, an alphabet that doesn't use it's like a visual alphabet so that's and I also want to open that dialogue to learn about other cultures you know like what what what's some what kind of symbols what do they mean to you like do you have a symbol that's something like this what it means in your culture I find it's very fascinating to learn about world cultures that way yeah me too and especially uh, I was attracted to your work the animal spirits mm -hmm. you make these symbols alive you know, come alive because you combine them and then it becomes your own language that you use to the language of these symbols but the way you combine them like into sentences and sentences say things so you say something that's very much alive through uh, those uh, geometrical symbolic works i love the language of symbols and it's really 
fascinating to me. And also, just my last observation as the uh, Russian person here <laughs> in the panel, uh, I know that there were not a lot of Russian uh, fur traders or, you know, the Russian community were not, was not large in Alaska. And that was a little bit of a consolation to me. Thank God there was, there were no like thousands and millions of Russians enslaving the Alaskan people. It was quite, quite small. Do you remember how many people, how many Russians lived at any single time? Um, it was definitely less than like 12,000 Russians, you know, of course they would marry and create their families that were mixed of like Russian and Alaskan native people. And those children of Russian men, they were given citizenship or sort of of Russia because they wanted them to, you know, become loyal to the the Russian royalty that was still part of Russian history that was still the government of Russia was the czars and so they were looking for more loyal subjects to their crown um, but for the most part there was not very many Russians and that's why they needed the Alaskan people to produce for their fur trade and when the animals started to become very hard to hunt and then things became out of style that's when they wanted to sell Alaska and they did sell it to America and you know there's a lot of Alaskan natives who live inland who never even met Russia and met Russians or never even met Americans and somehow you know they were bought and sold completely unaware of what was happening you know so it's interesting to me that you know Russians they came to Sitka and they were allowed to sell all this land that they never even touched to Americans who also never even touched it and um, they totally ignored, um, you know, the legal understanding that the native tribes had, like those totem poles. That's like a legal understanding to the native people of who owns this land and who has the rights to be here and who you have to seek permission to. And like, it's just interesting how Western cultures, they completely are just oblivious to native legal understandings of where we live and of our homelands. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's like another symbol that, you know, that's like another symbol, I guess, when we think about pieces of paper versus totem poles versus, I don't know, respecting humans. Yeah, and for me, this is one of the most important points that uh, this exhibition is making. I've been thinking about, you know, legal rights and how uh, people come to uh, another land and because their legal system is different from the locals, they say, this is ours. Uh, all out of the blue, it becomes their land. So thank you so much for sharing your art and making this important point in our exhibition here at the museum. Yes, we're so grateful. And I also want to acknowledge, um, we have a lot of reaching out uh, in the chat box and I know there are many people um, in this uh, event today from the native community who have different backgrounds that are very appreciative of this, of your extensive research and knowledge, Marlena. Um, I think a lot of people wanna know, you know, what other, you know, is there a future for this particular exhibition? Um, is there a possibility that this exhibition could travel? Uh, and then other projects that you might have going on that um, these folks would like to know about. I mean, if it wants to travel, it can. Like, because I'm a digital artist, I'm also fine with making it like a virtual um, thing that people can become educated on. Because a lot of the mm -hmm. pieces, if you come to the museum, the descriptions have a lot of information that, you know, I couldn't share during this presentation. And they're longer than the average museum label because there's so much history that I want to tell because mm -hmm. I think a lot of us in school we get basically a paragraph that Alaska was bought and sold for whatever million dollars and then that's it you never hear about it again and so a lot of the work I do is like educating people and sharing these stories and sometimes the descriptions can be quite long but I feel like it's worth it if you sit down and read it so I hope people do get the chance to come to the museum and if they can't then and if this show can't travel then I also be fine with creating it virtually so people can access this information. Um, 
And then upcoming projects, I am making an augmented reality piece this summer at Barry Mounds Park here in St. Paul. It will be called the Dakota Spirit Walk. You'll be able to like walk through with your phones and like the, I have picked four different spirits and each one will teach you a different part about our culture and help you understand, you know, how nature is our relatives and we need to be good stewards to the land. Cause I think as human beings an entire planet, you know, climate change is gonna be, uh, you know, it's really going to be a massive thing for us, our kids and their kids. So we really need to start opening our eyes to being, to not, to, to not being so divorced from nature, you know, to understand our actions. And so that's sort of, I want to bring our ancient stories to the present and modern technology because we need to learn, relearn this as human beings, I think, in order to save the planet. Wonderful. What an honor. It's so great to uh, get to know you and, and to have your work in our museum. Um, and you're right, you know, anything that we can do at the museum to make this exhibition accessible um, beyond the walls, um, especially after the, the exhibition closes on the 14th, um, we will certainly be working on that so that you can all experience it. I think that's, um, of course, we always want people in our galleries, but um, outreach and this uh, history is very, important and your work is very important. So thank you very much. Uh, this has been recorded and uh, many of you have asked if this will be posted. We will send you an email uh, with the link so that you're able to view it again. If you have any questions for Marlena or for us at the museum, uh, it's very easy to find our emails on the website and I can connect you with Marlena as well if you have direct questions for her. Any final comments, Masha, before we go? Well, uh, just want to thank Marlene again mm -hmm. for the great opportunity to learn more about this, you know, Russian American connection and this part of history. And uh, yeah, no, no more questions at this point, but I'm sure we will be talking later. Absolutely. Any final comments for you, Marlena? Um, I want to thank everybody who came and I see a lot of comments of people who, you know, are related to either the Russian or Alaskan natives. And, you know, they all have their own stories to tell. So to me, it's really interesting that, you know, this is an opportunity for people to talk about um, the past, how it still affects them today. And, you know, I never want to speak over Russians or Alaskan native stories. I just want to create the platform that people can use to start, you know, opening the door to more stories of the people who live in Alaska, because, you know, I don't want to appropriate anyone else's cultures or stories, tell histories that aren't mine, but I feel like we all have stories to tell and I just did the best I can to educating people to it. And you can find, you know, the authentic stories if, you, if you're out there listening for it. Absolutely. Thank you so much to both of you for a wonderful presentation today. Thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, again, we'll be posting this for later viewing and we hope that you'll see us on the second next week for our virtual grand opening of the three new exhibitions that will be in our galleries and that are, two of them are, and there'll be one more opening this Saturday. Thank you again, Marlena. We'll see you around, I'm sure very soon. It's nice to see you and thank you, Masha. Have a good day, everyone.